Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to the first of the virtual sessions hosted by, hosted by Mazar as part of the Reinventing the Wheel campaign. I am Sophie Lambin, CEO of Kite Insight, a research agency focused on sustainability issues, and I will be moderating this session this morning. Our sessions are focused on how companies, public authorities, entrepreneurs, and others in the mobility ecosystem can offer safer and more sustainable options in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are joined today by a panel of experts and leaders who will bring their global and regional perspectives and insights on these sustainability and mobility trends. Our goal is to explore the factors that are affecting how mobility is changing around the world and understand the challenges and opportunities faced by the key players in the mobility ecosystem. It is my great pleasure to welcome our speakers today. Bongiwe Bungay, Partners at Mazar, based in South Africa. Freddy Talberg, CEO of Emzol, a tech innovation company focused on reducing transport pollution. Jean-Francois Salzman, Partner at Mazar and based in China. Mathieu Ozano, Executive Director of the Shift Project, a think tank advocating the shift to a post-carbon economy and Remco Schrodenwerd, partner at Mazar, based in the Netherlands. Welcome, everyone, and welcome to our participants. So let me start with a few words of context. While the mobility infrastructure of the modern world is a wonder in many ways in how it has connected both our global economies and our local communi communities, it certainly also has come at a cost. Today, for example, international freight produces 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions and road transport in itself accounts for over 10%. Conventional combustion uh, engine vehicles have produced pollution that has had significant effects on the health of citizens in our cities. And what is very clear today, as the world races to zero carbon, is that the mobility sector has to change and has to change quickly. Paradoxically, COVID-19 has presented an opportunity to accelerate the transition to both an inclusive and a sustainable future, an opportunity we really cannot miss out on. Indeed, as the COP26 champion Nigel Topping was reminding us, decarbonizing transportation is really critical as we look to have greenhouse gas emission this decade and reach net zero emission in the next 30 years or even earlier. And it is very clear that automakers are really preparing for zero carbon transport future to meet what is increasingly an exponential demand for electric vehicle. A report published no later than last week reminded us that in 2016, Industry analysts forecasted that the internal combustion cars would account for 60% of cars sold in 2050. Today, it is quite hard to imagine them capturing more than a minority of sales by 2030. And such demand for change and solution are really coming from both mature and uh, emerging uh, economies. Last but not least, citizens increasingly are demanding for clean air, and it's also a, a very um, visible increasing trend. The case of Ella Kisi Debra, for example, in the UK, shows just that. This is a case of a nine-year-old girl in the United Kingdom who could soon become the first person to have air pollution listed as a cause of death when she suffered from an asthma attack and died, uh, unfortunately, in 2013. So with this quick uh, scene set, let me now ask our first speaker, Mathieu Ozano, director of the SHIFT project, to make a few opening remarks. Mathieu is also referred as the oil man, man but not necessarily for the reason uh, that you would think, as his blog in Le Monde for the last 10 years has really been uh, talking about a collective addiction to oil and how to transition away from it. 
So, Mathieu, the floor is yours to uh, seal set uh, this conversation. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophie, for the introduction. Uh, there's only a single point I would like to make in this brief uh, introduction. The point is uh, that contrary to the way uh, this issue is uh, seldom regarded, the question we're trying to address is not by far just a, an issue of technology. It's not just a matter of technology. System. Decarbonizing, especially uh, the, 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 the toughest spot, uh, which is daily transportation, commuting, decarbonizing, go, going beyond beyond uh, the let's say single single person in a, in a private car system takes a lot more than changing that car from uh, running on gasoline to a car that's running on 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 electricity, uh, supposedly decarbonized electricity. The issue is lot, much larger than that, and that's the that's what I would like to uh, give you a glimpse a glimpse at. Uh, the issue takes a systematic uh, investment approach, public approach. Next slide, please. Okay, so just to give you a rough example, the question that I'm solving in this uh, in this uh, in this uh, slide that comes from a, a study that we published uh, two years ago. Uh, no, I mean last year. No, it's not, it's not very important. So the question is, how many people in a car, in a single car, uh, for each of the people, for each person to equal the emissions of a single electric electric bicycle? So the the answer is uh, that's impossible. It would take 30 more than 30 people to to, to be stuck in a car uh, in order for each of them to equal the the emission of a single that person being on a, on, a, on, a, on a single electric bicycle, uh, diesel, even plug-in hybrid, and even hydrogen, which is presented as, as, the, as the golden way uh, to decarbonize mobility, it takes a lot more than that. So I'm gonna, then again, I'm gonna give you a glimpse at what, what it takes actually when I'm referring to systematic uh, investment approach. Next slide, please. So here are a few, um, um, balance comparisons well uh, our analysis at the the ship project uh, that we just released um, last week on a very on very specific area which is the the the, the seine valley from from paris to to le havre we, we look very precisely at the demographic figures our conclusion is that uh, developing uh, an alternative system to uh, sing, a single person in a private car system which rules today in uh, in suburbs uh, all around the, the developed world. Um, the answer for us is obviously you you would you would spare a lot of emissions uh, running a, a daily commuting system on a, a, a coherent combination of uh, using a bicycle, electrical bicycle, using buses, uh, you can, using car sharing. So that would uh, save a lot more. CO2 a lot more than just taking the same system with a different technology. And uh, what's more and what's very interesting for us uh, as a matter of lobbying for, 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 uh, for uh, such an evolution is uh, that it would take uh, very low public investments to develop that alternative system, very low. Uh, the figures you, you can see here are from five to 50 uh, euros per year per person. It would not change the commuting, uh, the daily commuting time. Uh, when you have that full system put in place in a coherent and uh, audacious way. And uh, what's more, it would let people spare money, spare money. Uh, having having a, a, a private car costs a lot. It costs a lot to the community, but it costs a lot uh, to uh, to each uh, household. So when you see that 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 kind of study, and again, this is was this was developed uh, from actual uh, local, very precise figures. Um, the question is, what are we waiting for to develop this alternative system for daily uh, daily transportation? Thank you. Um, 
Thank you, Mathieu. Um, you hear that? Um, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Mathieu. And what are we waiting for? I think it's a good um, a good challenge to to our speakers. Um, and we will invite you back in a conversation uh, in a bit. So let's start the conversation now. I will invite our speakers to use as much as possible example to illustrate your point. And also, please, let's make this as interactive as possible. So feel free to interject and react to what your fellow speakers are saying. I also invite the audience to please submit your question and we will uh, aim to season through the, the conversation. So my opening questions, uh, and I will go first to, to Remco, Bangiwe and Jean-Francois, is from where you sit. Hard top of mind is carbon reduction and these wider sustainability issues for the leaders in the mobility ecosystem that you are talking to. And then a follow-up question to that is how do you see COVID having impacted uh, their views and their decision as they consider those um, forces? And maybe Renko, I'll start with you and then Bangue, I will go to you next. Thank you, Sophie. Yes, as a national and international sector leader for transport and logistics, I see a lot of companies in the transport and logistics industry, which is a very diverse sector. Uh, we have B2B, we have B2C, we have transport via ship, train, truck, planes, uh, national and international orientated companies, and also transport of people versus transport of cargo. So there is a lot of differences in this sector. But regarding sustainability, all players in the sector have in common that clients of the sector, as well as governance, would like to see that the supply chain becomes more CO2, CO2 neutral, and carbon, carbon emissions should go down. This is a big challenge for the sector, since margins are low and investments in, for example, greener equipment are more expensive than the traditional equipment. So there is more needed than only intrinsic motivation of players in the sector and doing things smarter, for example, via innovation and automation, like Mathieu also said. The clients and the governments should be willing to, contrib to contribute in order to drive a change. Uh, clients, for example, by involving green criteria in their procurement policies and by engaging their uh, service providers, their TNL service providers, with long-term contracts so investments can be earned back. And governments, in my opinion, by promoting green investments with grants and enforce green behavior with regulation. Uh, only if that happens, I'm convinced that the chains will be there because then prices of mobility solutions become comparable, of prices of green mobility solutions become comparable or even cheaper than the polluting alternatives uh, that there are now. Thank you, Renko. Uh, on the point about uh, long-term contracts as, as a prerequisite for um, those companies in, in the logistic and transport industry making those investments. I mean, how have you seen that um, happening or evolving in the context of COVID, where I think long-term contract must have been um, a difficult, um, you know, hasn't exactly provided the right context for this sort of contract. Do you have examples that uh, led you to believe that this is happening? Yeah, yes, uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy to see that there are examples, but not a lot at the moment, to be honest. And, and to be honest, also not directly related to COVID. And when I look out my window here, and I have a look on the river between the harbor of Rotterdam and uh, the industry, the plant of the Heineken beer uh, trademark, if you all know uh, that. And, and barges go back and forward every day from the Rotterdam ha harbor to the, the Heineken factory, bringing full and empty bottles. And recently they introduced the first ever battery powered ship to do so. Uh, this is an innovation uh, which the barge, uh, the barge provider was only able to afford because it approached Heineken, articled, uh, articulated its sustainability ambitions and agreed a long-term contract. Uh, sharing its ambition, with a client uh, the size of Heineken, gave the company the security of knowing that this uh, significant investment in new battery-powered barges 
would yield a return over a longer period. Uh, otherwise, it would definitely have been too expensive. Yeah, no, that's a great example, and and what a great view to see the badge passing in silence uh, next to your to your window. Um, yeah, four times a day. <laughs> uh, way, I was wondering if you could, from your perspective and where where you sit, you know, how top of mind do you see those um, priorities of carbon reduction and those wider sustainability issues in in the mobility ecosystem? Thank you, Sophie, um, and good morning and afternoon to everyone. I think that, you know, from the South Af African perspective, certainly we have made the commitments as a country that we need to make. Uh, so we're one of the countries that have signed to the Paris Agreement. And we are now, you know, safely tucked into the beginning of the decade of action as, as, as narrated and communicated from the United Nations. Now, the decade, the decade of action is starting in 2020 to 2030, and this is the big shift that needs to happen. What excites me the most is that this is a global conversation um, with local nuances that are perhaps simpler and more complicated as, 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 as we move along the, you know, the, the narrative itself. Now, if you look at a country like ours in South Africa, they the one, th one thing is clear, we cannot achieve the net zero um, outside of the parameters of social equity. Um, and I'm, I'm going to qualify that by giving you a few uh, uh, statistics that, that, that shape that reasoning. And you know, our population is just under 60 million, 59 million to be exact. Um, and a big component of that, 35% of that is youth. Now we, as defined from ages, 15 to 34. And of the population, you have a good 43% by wide definition of the youth being unemployed. And you can immediately see from that about 8.8 .8 million of young people readily and able and willing to work cannot access economic activity. And a third of households are actually be below the living wage. So this complexity um, within the South African context tells us that if that dynamic does not change, this becomes a conversation for the few privileged. Um, and therefore, we cannot make the action and the progress that we are wanting to press towards uh, with, with, without substantial you know, improvement from, from, a, from, a, from a social uh, dichotomy. So about 46.7% of the South African common, you know, population accessing work um, and, and, and social activity is highly dependent on public transport for mobility. And leaning on to you know, what uh, Matthew, Matthew uh, shared with us, it certainly needs to be a pull and push from the bottom up and from the top down. We have significant um, you know, uh, narrative. And since the middle of last year, we saw the, the carbon tax come into effect in the country. Now that aids the conversation. But where I'm leaning towards with all the, the context that I've said is that we have to, in South Africa, quite speedily lean towards the business community and in our economic, you know, active economic from a business lens, 80%, 80% um, are SMEs. Uh, and this, 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 this is, in, is interesting for us because we have then to rely on pushing that agenda there and through the influence and, and, and the contribution of that particular crowd um, also expand the conversation. So from a sectorial perspective, uh, quite specifically when it comes to mobility, there is quite a few, very few case studies that are out there. Um, and I think that from a, from a, compens from a, um, a really encouragement perspective by, by uh, tax breaks and grants that are out there, it is still not significant for us to see the change that we want to see. So the, play, the part that we are intentional about moving and playing into is from a holistic integration of a sustainability strategy within the ambit of businesses. So that by so doing, we can start to make the impact that we want through the lens of education and influence the, the greater cosmic. We've done it um, for our client bases 
as well as ourselves. Um, and I want to say that the opportunity for mobility or sectarial approach is a lift as you rise. Um, and actually an improvement of that sector and expediating the conversation uh, at a speed that is acceptable for us to make significant contribution. Yeah, that's extremely clear. And I think this, this point about framing the narrative and, and uh, the, the opportunity as a to uh, carbon reduction and sustainability issue in the context of, of social equity and uh, economic empowerment is, is so um, important and powerful. Um, thank you for that. So, but wait, Jean-Francois, it'd be great to hear your perspective from where you sit in China and how top of mind you see this Again, how COVID has impacted uh, the, the current, uh, uh, you know, prioritization of those of those issues. Sophie, can, can you repeat the question? Sorry, because you were frozen in the middle. Oh, I'm sorry about that. So the question, uh, it, it was the same question that I asked to Remco and Bongue is how top of mind is carbon reduction and wider sustainability issues for leaders in the mobility ecosystem? And secondary, how has COVID impacted their views and decision and prioritizations? Okay, <clears throat> well, the first thing to, to say is, I believe China is already pretty well advanced in terms of uh, clean, uh, clean mobility. Uh, the, the, uh, the level of uh, uh, regulation on traditional, uh, traditional cars is, is at the, the highest level you, you can have at this stage. I mean, we, we reach uh, China 6, which is the equivalent of, of Europe 6 on uh, uh, the 1st of January. Uh, we have today the, the largest uh, NEV market in, in the world. I mean, it's, uh, it's 1.2 million vehicles sold uh, every year uh, and, and mainly plug-in uh, cars. So I would say the, the cleanest you, you, you can have in the city. So, so we are also very well advanced in, in the development to the alternative uh, to the ownership model. And, and uh, I, I echo what Mathieu said before, this is probably one of the most important changing behavior and, and changing the, the, the model. Here, China had an advantage because the, the level, the, the number of cars per person is, is much lower than what you can have in, in Europe or in the States. So people are not yet that used to have a car. And uh, thanks to the digital ecosystem uh, of, of China, it has been very easy to, to develop the whole uh, system of car sharing, uh, bikes, um, uh, electric, uh, electric bikes, etc. So clearly, a, a very uh, good integration of of all this transportation. Plus, on the top of that, a huge development uh, of uh, railway transportation. We we have today uh, the largest uh, high speed uh, network in the world. I think the the Chinese high speed network is today more than uh, the um, all other network everywhere in the world combined. So clearly, you know, having this infrastructure helps. Okay, but that's when you look, uh, I would say a relatively narrow, um, when, when you have a relatively narrow frame. If you take a little bit of perspective, so okay, yeah, clear, the, 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 the car are clean, uh, the train are clean. This being said, we still have 70% uh, of the electricity produced um, via, uh, which is carbon based. And 90% and of this 70% is based on coal, which is the worst you can have in the world. So clearly now the, the work for the future, if we want to, uh, to, to really come to an actual clean mobility, will be to work upstream uh, on, on the production of electricity to decrease uh, the, uh, the carbon emission from, from the source, I would say. And, and this is something that, that is very much present now in the mind of, of the, the politicians in, in China, because you, you spoke about leadership 
in the industry, China is a bit different because decision making is is first at the, at, at the political level. And, and clearly, when you look at the 14th plan, when you look at uh, uh, Xi Jinping uh, speeches to the United Nation in, in September, uh, the, the goal to have a clean, um, a, a clean China uh, is clearly high on the agenda. I mean, uh, according to, to uh, Chairman Xi, uh, he expects the peak in terms of carbon emission to be in 2030, and, and China should be completely carbon neutral between 2050 and 2060. So clearly, this is extremely high on, on, on the agenda. Uh, thank you, Jean-François. Remco, I'm just wondering whether you would react to that, having said, you know, having highlighted the importance of, of government intervention and, and regulation in the context of the, the green uh, recovery. Um, what do you see happening in the European context to accelerate uh, that transition? And you probably are somehow um, envious of the Chinese context, right, which uh, um, gives you that level of, of infrastructure and, and support. Well, I can only conclude that Europe uh, is aiming to beat China because I heard Jean-Francois saying that China should be completely uh, climate neutral between 2050 and 2060. Well, I can tell you that the European Green Deal aims to make Europe the first climate neutral uh, continent in 2050. So we are a bit ahead uh, on, uh, on China, Jean-Francois. So yes, there is some, let's say, governmental pressure due to that uh, European Green Deal. But I think we are all aware, and at least all the, the countries are uh, pretty well aware, that there are big steps uh, uh, ahead of us uh, to, uh, to come to that uh, goal of being uh, the first climate neutral continent in 2050. So this is the kind of competition uh, we want to emulate uh, in this case. But what do you see particular in the transport and logistics sector that is uh, happening or, or in terms of uh, government intervention and legislation? Well, um, we see uh, things uh, or uh, ideas like uh, promoting companies being green uh, by uh, giving them an award. Uh, and yes, we see some uh, uh, initiatives in terms of grants, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, there are still no uh, big steps that I see that, that really make the change. Uh, and and, and for, for, for example, um, I think uh, the, the, the COVID situation make that, that online shopping is rising and uh, home deliveries are, uh, yeah, uh, growing very fast. Uh, Netherlands in, is in a lockdown now. I think I see between five, ten days a day, I see a parcel delivery company coming into the street, bringing parcels uh, almost at every, uh, at every home. And, and I think there should be a, a thought of an, a scenario moving, uh, to, uh, moving uh, towards the last mile as a, as a public utility, because I think there are big steps to, uh, and big gains there in that, in that area, because um, many of the companies servicing the demand of the parcels will duplicate services and, and produce uh, unnecessary uh, emissions. Um, and, and I think as a result, uh, governments, states and local authorities might take responsibility for that last mile delivery. Uh, that could reduce the number of journeys per delivery and, and help run the service as sustainable as possible via, for example, electric vans coming into the street only one time a day with all your parcels of the day, uh, uh, giving you a ping, you open the door, open the electric van and take out your parcels of, of that day. So if you think of that kind of solutions, I think governments can do a lot more than they do at the moment. Uh, that's super interesting. Sort of less sharing of people, but sharing of parcels in the in that new world order. That's that's really interesting. Uh, Bungue, if I can come back to you on how do you see South Africa and Southern Africa companies within the mobility sector responding particularly to that green recovery challenge and context? 
Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's very important to note that from an executive level, from a strategic level, um, that is where the, the, the biggest need, need, impact needs to be made. That's where the dialogue needs to change. Um, and it's quite clear from our perspective that you can never manage what you haven't measured. So, so the lack of knowing your impact um, is, is what is delaying the progress. Now, when you look into the, you know, the mobility sector per se, um, it is still um, you know, um, stuck in an era where we have overtaken it. COVID has come and it has lasted longer than we had anticipated. And therefore the natural um, reshaping of the businesses and the thought process and the remodeling certainly has pre presented an opportunity for the progressive dialogue that, that we are aiming for. Um, and we are starting to see, particularly when we pay attention to you know, um, our logistics and, and, and transportation um, kind of clients, that this is starting to emanate at a conversational level, but at the right level where it is an ex at an executive level. Lastly, I just want to note that outside of that specific sector, there are a lot of businesses who seem to not have a massive impact when it, it comes to, the, to, 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 the, to this conversation, such as professional services firm. Now, if I lean on to what um, my, my co-panelists have said uh, here, you will note that within the, the, the carbon, uh, you know, uh, footprinting is, is divided into three scopes. And the last one is the scope three, which encapsulates your business travel as well as your employee commute. And this, um, in an analysis that we have performed likely, can take up to 50% of your total uh, emissions, which is directly linked to a behavior that needs to change. Now, cumulatively, that effect, uh, when you look at the business lens, is exactly the kind of progress that can take us forward. Uh, thank you, Bongiwe. And Freddie, I'm coming to you next, but just for Jean-Francois, I wanted to, to ask you to react to Mathieu's comment in the chat saying, you know, all those cars which you said in China are mostly co-produced. Can you just give us a little bit of a sense of how uh, China is moving, is, is greening its infrastructure, and what, what are they plan in the medium to longer term? Uh, you on mute, Jean-François. Still can't hear you. It's still much. Okay, now. Um, so, um, but the, the first thing is, if you speak about mobility, uh, the, 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 the State Council uh, announced already in, uh, in, in November that they want to bring uh, the number of uh, the percentage of NEV sold uh, from 5% today to 20% of the overall sale of, of uh, personal car in 2025. So clearly we see that there is a, a strong push to toward the, the NEV, but I understand Mathieu's point, which is, okay, so what if uh, producing batteries uh, is extremely polluting and if electricity is still uh, based on, on coal? And, and that's a fair comment. What we know is, what we see is uh, there are now a huge investment uh, in China in uh, decarbonated uh, energy. Clearly, in in, uh, in, um, in the nuclear area, I mean, China had almost no uh, no uh, nuclear power. I would say ten years ago. Now, uh, now it, it exists, and and they still want to multiply the number the, the capacity by seven over the next uh, twenty years. There is also a huge investment in solar. Uh, the, the goal is to multiply the existing uh, park that is already important in China by 10 in the next 20 years and, and to multiply the uh, offshore wind production by, uh, by 7. I'm not saying 7%, 10%. It's multiplied by 7, multiplied by 10. So we, we come to something that is supposed to be enormous in uh, by 2035. Uh, uh, we are speaking about 80% of the um, uh, the equivalent of 80% of the nuclear power we, we have today 
everywhere in the world, it's four times the total production uh, of uh, solar energy today, and it's three times the production of total wind energy today. So the, 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 the plan are extremely ambitious, extremely ambitious. And let's, and, not forget, and let's not forget also that even today, 20% of the energy uh, produced in China is renewable energy, mainly through uh, thanks to, to, uh, to, to dams, to, to water, but it's, they still have done, uh, they still have gone a long way on developing renewable energy. Great, thank you, uh, Jean-Francois. And I think that's a good uh, lead into Freddy um, to the extent that you know, air pollution is a massive uh, issue in China and uh, the concern of population about uh, air pollution and health, uh, impact on health is huge. So Freddy, if I can move it to you and, and get your perspective as to what you think is the biggest driver for uh, greening a, a mobility ecosystem and while responding to that question, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, what your company is doing. Yes, um, Sophie, thank you. Um, yes, Emso, yeah, my background is more tech entrepreneurship, so we're the sort of the innovators trying to sort of find a space and deliver in this in this sector, which is really exciting. But we are definitely an early stage disruptive technology business. We won the Tech for Good Award for this year in London Tech Week. Uh, and what we do is we deliver net zero to the logistics supply chain. So it's stuff that uh, we're talking about the scope three that we are looking to build some innovative technology to help big corporations just deliver the net zero and manage that complex process. And we do that by monitoring and measuring using IoT hardware. So we deploy a lot of measurement technology at different locations. And, um, and we build a sort of procurement framework to enable supply chain to say, I can deliver you goods and services at, 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 a, at, a, environment, at a minimal environmental impact, and we can measure that. And I think what's really quite crucial for us is to recognize that a lot of the uh, transport and logistics is very road-based. And so we're not going to be a getaway from managing that road base. And so for us, we want to make sure we use innovation to drive the good guys. The good guys who really give a damn and who really care and who have the ability to do things, we can set standards through innovation. And, and that to me is is what we did uh, in, before in, in London. And I think this, this opportunity is huge for us in terms of driving innovation. So I think the things that will drive mobility is people who give a damn, people who've got money who give a damn, and certainly the younger generation who go, actually, I'm not going to accept goods and services unless they are sort of green. And, and I think that younger generation is going to be a huge catalyst for us. And uh, and uh, so, so for us, you know, as innovators, is really exciting space. We just got to innovate the heck out of this to enable the good guys and the industry to do it without tons and tons of regulation. I don't, I'm almost really a bit more of a sort of anti-regulation type person because I think I've seen it and it takes a long time and it's fraught with dispensations and and and, and, and time and and I don't want to wait to 2050 to go yippee we've got there is we need to drive things. And I think we as innovators and the technology we have, we can drive behavioral change really rapidly. And I think we have the momentum to do that. So I don't want to talk about 2050 or 2040. What can we achieve in the next couple of years? Uh, thank you, Freddy. I'd love to maybe invite uh, Remco, Jean-François Bangoué, or uh, Mathieu to react to, to what Freddy just said and, and your views on the potential of, of data-driven a green and sustainable uh, mobility solution to, to scale uh, and accelerate um, um, you know, the, those solutions. I have a question for Freddie. Freddie, do you also have a lot of Chinese clients? Because I understand that in China there is a strong focus on green supply chain via green supply chain management, uh, which, is, uh, which has been regarded as a very effective tool in China for mitigating uh, the negative effects that firms have on the environment. Is there, are Chinese companies on your client list, Freddie, or not? Yeah, at the moment, unfortunately not, because we're focused very much in, the, in Europe and UK, and, we're sort of, and we know how hard it is here to impose those, those things. And so, so we're much more of an enterprise-led, gently, gently evidencing approach, but not very authoritative in that sense. And even 
the stuff that Transport for London and other authorities do here is very, you know, long lead times, long consultations. And so I think that the, the, the Chinese can really drive the agenda by showing excellence and, and winning on autocratic sort of regulation around how things happen. But, but certainly from our point of view, it takes a lot longer, certainly in Europe, to, to sort of try and get the evidence and build that process, which is you know, which is just part of the innovator's nightmare and challenge, right? And and we're underfunded to, to, to do that. But what I do like and what I think is happening is as the industry recognizes that there's issues and the regulations coming, that opens up the funding opportunity. So I think as the funding opportunities open up as regulation moves in our direction, that gives us the fuel to really drive that change. Okay. So Freddie, by the way, I fully say... sorry, I sorry. fully agree, Freddie. By the way, that 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 IT and, and data analytics uh, can can really drive the change. Uh, I saw a good example of that re uh, of that recently. I was with a company, and they are uh, promoting green behavior by coaching truck drivers, and, and by giving truck drivers uh, analytics about how they drive. They uh, at the end uh, uh, come to the situation that they reduced the use of petrol and the COD, uh, CO2 emission with 10% only by giving feedback to truck drivers about how the way how, uh, how they drive. So I think that's a good example that that IT and innovation data uh, can can drive the change. And I, I know it's only 10%, but if we all oh, we, can we have, make we have it. A good, we have we have a, a good example because that's been around for some time in terms of driver analytics and driver behavior. But we now measure the pollution impact. When someone's doing a delivery, we can measure the amount of pollution caused by that delivery activity. And that and showing to the driver and the fleet owner that this vehicle is not impacting air pollution and the energy displacement for that energy for that delivery activity is quite low. And that's really exciting for them to go, wow, the investment I've made in my clean fleet really is paying dividends. But we've got to convert that into the procurement. So when people are buying, they need to have evidence-based data around the environmental impact of, of those things. And, and as we're getting closer to the technology enabling that data, then we, we will accelerate like crazy, I suspect. So, Freddie, maybe one follow-up question, and then Mathieu, I'll come to you on on just reflecting maybe your, your views on how we need to accelerate all those interesting trends. But what is the main impediment, uh, from your point of view, Freddie, to accelerating uh, the adoption? Uh, if the the technology is there, uh, what what is the main impediment to accelerate the adoption of those uh, data-driven solutions? Uh at the moment, in, in the UK, there's a lot of planning regulations, and the planning regulators aren't come. They, 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 it's, it's, it's like a, uh, we're not prescribing enough objective data. It's all, you know, we would like you to 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 be green, but what does that you mean? Would like <laughs> so, so, so it's 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 about getting the local authorities say, in my planning regulations, I can have a bit more definitive objective data, and and each of the you know, and so one of the things could be when you build a building is you've got to evidence what the carbon impact was when you built that building and what your plan is to offset that carbon impact when you built it. And having those absolute measurements as opposed to just figmented sort of greenwashing sort of data. So uh, um, I think it is the objective data will lead us to a path of, um, of, of, of liberation in the space. Thanks, Freddie. Mathieu, I thought I'd circle back to you um, as you have opened this conversation. You know, can you share some of your reflection? This is really about you know, accelerating what is the technology that is already there, the practice that are being placed, the, the narrative around uh, the opportunities for, for um, uh, clean mobility. Can, can you share some of your perspective on that? How can we move yes, fast? I would like to react by with a joke. The, the issue is not to accelerate, as you just said. The, the issue is to slow down. On the contrary, um, the, 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 this kind of conversation, I'm always a little bit uh, uncomfortable because we talk we talk a lot, about, a lot about tools. When I think I believe that what is missing is not tools; it's the assembly plan. You can you can see, for instance, I'd like to give you two two examples of that. 
two examples of that. One legislative and one techni technological. Legislation. Uh, when you look at the, uh, at, the, at the impact of carbon taxes, which is considered as the main uh, biggest uh, tool to achieve uh, decarbonization of transportation, um, if you um, increase the price of gasoline, and there is no way for you to buy a, a, an electric car or to have at your disposal uh, a railway station or a bus or whatever, you just stuck with a gasoline price that's gone up and that's all. So you have a tool, you have a big hammer, and it's very easy to put that hammer on your thumb. And that's what happened, for instance, in France, but all over the world, the, the same experience happens. People just don't understand and don't see why they should pay for a, a uh, more expensive uh, gasoline where the, the alternative, the systemic alternative is not there, is not there. Um, so that's the first tool that does not make the assembly plan. And the second one is IT, uh, IT solutions. Um, it does not take, for me, uh, it does not take a very fancy algorithm to let a trucker understand that if he stamps on the, on the pedal and brakes all the time very strongly, of course, his, his consumption of oil is going to increase. He knows that if he's a good professional. Obviously, he knows that. So, and you have to 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 see to figure that IT is the highest um, increasing carbon footprint impact all over the world. The, the the carbon footprint impact of IT, when you take it globally, it's already today comparable to uh, airlines. And if you and if you look at the trend. The exponential uh, growth trend, especially with with uh, with IoT coming up, uh, you will just blow, break the roof. It should uh, it should be higher than uh, even uh, private car transportation within ten days, within ten years. I'm sorry if you if you look at the rate of increase today. So do we we have to first we have to have a coherent and bold assembly plan. And in that plan, we have to see what tool is uh, best and what tool is, you know, like a double-edged sword, like for instance, uh, IT uh, solutions uh, or in, in, in a certain respect or, uh, or carbon taxes when it does not fit with a global assembly plan, a global coherent public policy. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, uh, Freddie, you have some, some views on that, um, but I want to go to, to Bangui. Uh, Matthew was saying we need to slow down. I wonder how that resonates in a, a South African or African context when we think about um, you know, how we, how we um, make the case for change with, with consumers. Um, I wonder whether you could bring some perspective of how you see companies interacting with consumers and, and contributing to shift the mindsets towards um, this um, cleaner, greener mobility. Absolutely. Um, you know, the, the, good, the good news about the conversation that we're having is that it is quite clear to all of us that nature is not going to wait for humanity to clarify their minds and their priorities as to where they lay. It's not waiting for us. Um, the second good news is that we have, in my opinion, sufficient personal experience of adverse climate changes that have impacted us on a personal level, first and foremost, at a domestic level and in business, in economies, et cetera. So therefore, that provides us with a very good uh, lens in which to start digesting this conversation. What is an opportunity has always, always got to appeal to the human element within the conversation. I do want to say that at times we are quite successful at um, making the conversation quite complex to such an extent that the penetration is to how do I become involved? What lifestyle or behavioral changes do I do at an individual level to expedite this in the right direction uh, remains the critical question. So 
my submission is is one we simplify the narrative we appeal on the personal application which we have significant experience in and we clarify the business case as to where the shift needs to go and this builds a whole lot of sense of vulnerability in the ecosystem and we start to see the progress that we are after because at the end of the day if it is understood as a non-negotiable we have more opportunity i'm also not a fan of the stick approach but the carrot we have more opportunity to actually collaborating in the similarly bigger conversation Thank you. Uh, Bangui, I just want to mention that we have really nine minutes left on, on this conversation. So I'm, I'm starting to think about uh, closing and, and if people can think about the closing remarks uh, as well. Uh, maybe, Freddie, um, first I wanted to ask you to maybe if you wanted to react to what Mathieu uh, was saying earlier about the um, carbon cost of, of IT and, and maybe um, I was interested as well on your views on, on sort of the buzzing entrepreneurship around um, you know, this technology solution. What do you see in your ecosystem of entrepreneurs and what do you see is needed for those entrepreneurs to succeed and, and scale? Uh, I think, uh, I think what's, what's interesting now, I think the, the sector, clean tech sector, is becoming a bit more uh, recognized as a viable return on investment because before it wasn't a strong return on investment. So I think hopefully this will drive uh, more investment into into the uh, sustainability sector certainly the building i work in is we've got some amazing entrepreneurs driving phenomenal sustainable businesses and and only more recently are they starting to get reckon, recognized as investors putting money in, into them so i think money coming into the sector is going to be quite exciting certainly access to talent is is a lot it became a lot easier for purpose led businesses so so we're going to be pulling in a lot of people who want to get involved in purpose led businesses so i think it is going to be led by younger generations with with access to to money um in in terms of um Mateo's issue about um, IT costs. Yeah, I, I sort of agree. I think it's a bit of a hidden thing. It, no one really appreciates the impact of carbon on the IT side. But uh, um, but I think you know there is innovation around reducing that and managing that. But but you know trying to get kids off their um, off their mobile phones and doing things and telling them this is a sort of you know you know if you if you come off your Instagram you, you're saving carbon. It'd be like you, you try telling that to kids. But at the moment, I think. Um, I think we'll, we'll have to innovate a way around that um, that particular sort of carbon impact one. But um, I think there is still a lot of greenwashing. There is a lot of uh, evidence that's been out there. Um, but it's for me, one of our challenges is linking air pollution or climate pollution or the energy displacement that causes pollution and the climate change impact. And I think one thing that I'm really sort of not so happy about is the concept that you can pollute in the city, but you can offset in another continent. And it's about trying to bring it much more local to say, actually, how do I care about my local community? How do I deliver that blend of climate impact and pollution impact in my local community? And, and that's the innovation that we need to drive. And hopefully the funding and, and people will drive that. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Freddie. So I'll um, ask the, the last questions and maybe if you could uh, each think about in a few words uh, responding to it so that we can go one small round uh, the virtual table so what would your advice be to companies and, and leaders across the mobility ecosystem looking to accelerate uh, their drive towards a green recovery i know you're saying Mathieu, is about slowing down maybe it's people slowing slowing down and the solution accelerating um, and what should those uh, companies and their leaders prioritize? And maybe Francois, I go to you, Jean-Francois, sorry, I go to you first. If you answer this question from the point of view of, of companies that you are advising. You, you know, um, the, the um, Company and, 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 and people have their own responsibility and we not all need to do whatever we can to, to, to limit our carbon footprint. But, you know, we, we somehow all know that and, and, and it was already repeated by everybody. 
This being said, I don't think that um, we will achieve uh, a real change without a, a strong uh, political drive. Uh, we need to act as, as he as citizen, as voter, to push uh, policy. Uh, we need to have regulation. I, I, Bongiwe, you, you mentioned uh, the carrot and the stick. I think it's important we have both the carrot and the stick. We need to have uh, ambitious plan. We need to have um, investment in infrastructure. Uh, we need to have uh, subsidies and, and we need to have penalties. And, and without all this political drive, I'm not sure we'll be able to completely change the situation. Thank you, Jean-François. Mathieu, I go to you next. What would you say are the key priorities for companies and the leaders as they drive uh, the green recovery? and Green mobility. Well, I, I, I'd say I've just uh, I've already answered. The, the the idea for me is if you want to have a to understand what's happening regarding the evolution of mobility, you have to make a good look, take a good look at the co coherence of the assembly plan, not just at any single tool. Yeah. Because the issue is a systemic issue; it's not a technology technology issue. Thanks, Mathieu. Way? I will. I will not. I will come with two things. The first one is triple P. Uh, Public-private partnerships are essential for us to be able to get there. The second thing is that for the business community, keep asking yourself, what is the real bottom line that you have? All-encompassing, including what you emit, how you emit, and how you are impacting on the with the planet. What is the real bottom line? Thank you, Bengui. Freddy, and then I'll end with you, Remco. Yeah, I think my uh, my experience with the we you know we try to sell to sustainability managers and environmental managers and organisations, and I think what we've learned about it is organisations just have a department and they go, oh well, they, they'll take care of that, and I think. What we've got to do now, we need to have a sustainability person directly reporting to the chief executive and, and them teaching all the individual departments what sustainability means for the organization, not the organization saying, oh, we have a sustainability department that, that takes care of all the net zero stuff and all the climate stuff, but get them to build a culture in the organization from the senior management to say, here's what sustainability means in all your departments and drive the education through one person, not a department. And I think that I've seen some really good evidence of that. And I think it's a really powerful approach to having a top-down approach to what sustainability means across the every element of the organization. Because people, once they know, once they care, and they're told to have their care and they can be educated, then they can come up with the options and solutions. Mainstreaming education. Thank you, Freddie. And uh, Remco, if you can have the final word. Well, thank you. I think a lot has been said. Uh, I think it all starts with people. People and leaders should care uh, and should behave accordingly, uh, including having a plan, like Mathieu said. Uh, and if we want a greener world, we need to invest, uh, not only with money, but also in creating awareness and, and training the way we can change our behavior. And yes, at the end, regulation will help. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, all of you, for, for your insights and contribution. Uh, we set ourselves the challenge of looking at, at um, you know, opportunities to certainly not slow down this uh, inevitable transition uh, in the context of a, of a COVID world that paradoxically has actually uh, opened the door for uh, a great, um, I think, sensitization to both uh, the benefit of regulation, second, uh, our own vulnerability, and, and third, uh, the absolute um, necessity to accelerate that transition. 
And I thought we, we uh, had a really uh, useful conversation about uh, the different ways we can approach that, uh, those challenges, but also those opportunities. So thank you everyone for your contribution and thank you for participants for um, attending this conversation. I want to point out that this is part of a series of um, articles that uh, can be found on mazar.com. Uh, if you want to, to follow the conversation there. And there's also going to be a series of follow-up uh, webinar that will happen in the next few uh, weeks and months. So stay tuned on the mazar.com website to see how this conversation is evolving. So thank you again, everyone, for your participation. Until very soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.